So good afternoon, everybody. Um, so Pata is amazing for a lot of reasons. But uh, number one, I never knew that he taught at the Gordon Institute. I never knew he was at MIT. And I, I only thought that he came like for dinner at Gordon Institute. Whenever we were having a class, Father would show up and eat heartily and then leave. So I thought he was you know, a homeless person. <laughs> and uh, he would just come in and we'd say hello to him and he'd, he'd leave. But Father is, is very clever. Um, and by introduction, I might just say, this is, for me, uh, Hanukkah time. So it means I'm Jewish. And Partha knew that. And he, he, what we didn't know was that the woman I married was uh, Roman Catholic. So between both religions, there's enough guilt to go around <laughs> that when my son was born and learned to talk, the first words out of his mouth were, I'm sorry, <laughs> because it kind of covered him for the day, and then he could go on and, until the next day and then uh, be fine. Uh, but his, his um, playing upon my guilt, you know, we have very important topics to talk about, Jerry, you have to be here. And I'm thinking, you know, as my dear students, former students and so forth know, I, I drive three hours from New Hampshire to come here and, and then teach for three hours and then go home for three hours. Driving six hours to teach a three-hour class, who does that? Me. And he knew I'd come because this is the top, these are topics that I, I love. I love the way that he linked drought and leadership. When I first saw the title, I said, what the book? Maybe I'll just Google this. Drought and leadership. Uh, I mean, water and leadership. And there's nothing. There really is nothing. The internet has thousands of, of hints on everything except water and leadership. It, it has some things about metropolitan uh, commissions that look over water. But the more I started to think about it, this is, this is pretty bad. I mean, the situation is bad. Even in the town next to me up in New Hampshire, two days ago, my wife told me, she teaches up there, uh, that the, they can't drink the water. There's a lot of lead in there. So people thought, well, boil the water. We well, can't boil the water because the lead doesn't go away. So I'm thinking, this is, this is serious right here in Little New Hampshire. And I don't, you know, my thinking must be very narrow. But I know my thinking isn't narrow because I, I love the world and I love what's in it. And if you look back as recently as this week, look at the events in this world. We had this crisis in Australia, right, with this terrorist and then the shootings and then death. The, ne the next day we have uh, reports about hacking from North Korea into Sony. Then we have this terrible massacre in Pakistan. Uh, 140, it was even more I heard on the news this morning driving up. 49 kids, basically most of them, died. Uh, and, uh, and then the hacking thing is, is again very real. And then I think about leadership. And, and the, you know, what are the leaders of Sony doing right now? And then even listening to uh, our president yesterday at his news conference, he said, I wish they had asked me. I, I would have told them not to do what they did, which was to cancel this, this movement, right? You know, all know what I'm talking about. You're this smart. So um, <laughs> even in the short period of a week, we have a drought of leadership. These people at Sony must be quivering in their boots. There's going to be lawsuits up the wazoo. And it deals with real live leadership issues, this issue of, of how can a country like North Korea, in effect, censor our freedom of expression in this country? which we, we wound up doing. That's gonna to lead to a lot of discussion, forget the lawsuits. It, it, what are we gonna do about it? And these, these leaders, I'm sure they're all holed up in rooms somewhere. I heard the president of Sony the other night talking and he thinks he's got it all figured out, but I know he does. This leadership thing is my passion. I don't know as much about water, but I do know about me, that I talk about <coughs> leadership a lot. And I think I feel bad that I don't do more. And so when I see young faces in this audience, this is the future. You guys are the future. Now, I had, I've already told them, and I'm really pissed off at them because at my classes when they showed up, jeans and a t-shirt. Now they're all wearing ties. But for me, nothing. I have that dress up for them. Now they're dressed up for you, Partha. So you must, you know. I'm honored. Yeah. So I want to just talk. I have a little bit period of time. But as my former students know, you're not going to be sitting this to me, right? You're gonna to have to. You're gonna be up and doing something, and I'll tell you that in a minute. But let me just give you my quick overview of leadership. Now, how many of you could give a definition of leadership? Raise your hand. Every hand in the place should be up. I'm gonna ask again. How many of you can define leadership? Raise your hand. 
there's still some of them holding out. I'm not going to tell. You all know about leadership. Everyone in this room, if you had a test that was going to determine if you could leave this room, you had to give a definition. You give a definition. And dollars to donuts, every one of you would be correct to some extent. But you wouldn't have the whole picture. And nor do I. That's why I love this as a topic. And I know bad leadership when I see it. But all I have to do is pick up the newspaper in any city, town, country, and see the mistakes that leaders have made or try to be leaders, ranging from dictators to liberals to conservatives. doesn't matter. It's a tough subject, and it's a brilliant subject. Now, my view of leadership takes two forms. One is, my definition for years used to be that leaders make meaning. Leaders make meaning. And one good example is Steve Jobs. What's the most successful product in, in Apple history? Anyone know? iPhone? Maybe. Wrong. Mac? No. iPod? What? Mini. iPod Mini. You're correct. And the iPod Mini, I don't know, Blackboard's or after this, use my the, the curve, the revenue curve and the profit curve went straight like this. And any CEO worth his or her salt would look at that curve and say, my God, we've got a winner here except Steve Jobs, because once he saw that curve going up, right, right at that point on the axis where it began to shoot almost vertical, he was the only CEO in the world that said, we've got a problem. Steve, are you out of your mind? Everyone should have a problem like this. But he knew that he, across his desk came an order of 20,000 iPod touches from Kazakhstan. What are they going to do with them? They're going to take them apart, they're going to rip them apart, they're going to find out the insides, they're going to reverse engineer, they're going to make them in a lot of different colors, have more characteristics, and sell them for half the price. So at that point, he started thinking iPhone, right? And he would want, he'd take any hundred leaders, he would be the one who would be. So he made meaning of, of this curve that most of us would have said, let's sit back and just wait for the curve to drip down a little bit. So then I thought, well, this doesn't really make sense. Of course leaders make meaning, but the future of leadership, in my opinion, is gonna be what we're doing here. We will make meaning together. Now I do an exercise, and some of, the, of you who are not in my class will know the exercise of Harry Potter's Castle. Anyone remember that? Raise your hand. What was it about? Tell, tell, just stand up there, give me a quick resume of what the, what the exercise is like. Um, it's kind of <laughs> you come together with a bunch of sort of every kind of nonsense materials and then try well, to... Excuse me, there's a lot of thought in it. Not necessarily nuts. And then just trying to get the people together to have a vision of what you can create, what sort of structure you can create that's something like a castle out of disparate bikes. Yeah, and you had a half hour to do it, broke the group up into two groups, and then with about five minutes left of the time, I called the time out. And I got both groups together and I said, you know something? We're trying to get this done as effectively as we can, and there's a ton of redundancy in the year, redundancy in the year. So now, I'm gonna call a merger of both teams into one, if you've got 15 minutes to come up with a finished product. And there hasn't been a single group that either the Center for Creative Leadership or at TGI that hasn't done it in 15 minutes, and brilliantly. But during the debrief, I asked the question, who was the leader? And people go, oh, Sam knows who, knows Joan. No, we didn't have a leader. And, and playing the devil's advocate, which good professors are supposed to do, I said, of course you had to have a leader. No, we didn't have a leader. So guess what? They really define what I'm calling more community meaning making, that we make meaning together. I bet in your group and in your group and in your group, there was someone who said, well, we're in chaos now. We have to merge together these two ideas. Uh, I, I'm going to step up to the plate. And, I, and someone else, why don't we do this? And someone who was very quiet during the first part of the exercise jumps into B. And the people made meaning together. And I think the Boston Pledge is, is doing that in terms of its leadership. The answers are in this room and outside this room and other people, all the 500 people that showed up at Bentley and other people that have been um, uh, knowing about the Boston Pledge. So that's one thing. I think the future of leadership more is in community meaning making, me making meaning together. Now secondly, I was very blessed to work with a guy named Peter Senge. 
I know some of my former students have heard of Senge. Anyone else heard of Senge, Peter Senge? He's at MIT. And uh, if you Google the Society for Organizational Leadership, you, you will learn a ton. Peter Senge wrote a book in 1990 called The Fifth Discipline, The Art and Practice of the Learning Organization. Since then, he's written a book called The Field Book. He's written a book about uh, uh, dancing with change, a book about changes in, in schools using the notion of learning organizations. And when he talks about learning organizations, he talks about five disciplines. And this has always been at the core of whatever teaching I've been doing or my beliefs in leadership. The first and foremost, the foundation for good leadership is self-awareness, heading toward personal mastery. And guess what? As well as everyone in this room thinks they know themselves, you don't. And all my former students that took the 360s, we give a 360 in the class, it's amazing. This is with engineers primarily, but it's true for IT professionals, dentists, doctors, uh, scientists. Guess what they did on a scale of, of one to five, in terms of five being the highest, a hundred different questions, their average score was about a three. Their raters, 15 and 16 other people, including their boss, peers, and direct reports, on average gave them a 4.3. So think about this. A 1.3 differential on a five-point scale is a significant number. And when I asked people, how did you rate yourself so low? First, the answer was what I call the God answer. Only God can get a five. The best I can do is a four, so I get a five. Move her out of the way. And we are now what? And with engineers and scientific people and bright people like everyone in this room, we're not perfect. We're not perfect. We're not there yet. And then we talk one on one. I tell them, of course, the only two people that are perfect are Partha and myself. And that's after you know them then being judges. So um, so the, so the first the, so they don't know themselves well, and, and that's the journey we take in here at Gordon Institute. The journey of greater self-awareness toward personal mastery. The second is creating a shared vision. And problems like these, water, leadership, environment, terrorism, have to involve a, a, a common vision. Now, I was very fortunate years ago um, to be a pioneer in trade with the People's Republic of China. In fact, I was one of the first American businessmen to go to China. And in fact, I wound up getting invited to the White House when, when Deng Xiaoping made his first visit to the United States, the first Chinese premier to come to the United States. Now, it was not without its funny moments. I was in a receiving line, and Shirley MacLaine was in front of me, and Dick Cabot was behind me. And the reporters are going, and who's the Jewish kid in the middle? It's me, don't worry, you won't be seeing me here very often. But the, the notion of creating a shared vision, our shared vision, as bizarre as it sounds, was holding hands with the Chinese and marching into the 21st century holding hands with the Chinese and marching into the 21st century. Well, after our CEO mentioned this to our team in Boston and he left the room, guess what everyone else did? <clears throat> that was the funniest, most ridiculous thing I ever heard. And it is ridiculous. And in fact, we did a billion dollars worth of two-way trade, and I never held hands with any Chinese. That's not really true. Because about 10 years ago, I adopted a beautiful little girl from China, and I hold her hand all the time. But when I was doing business in China, it was tough negotiations. But it proves something very important about creating a shared vision. It's not what the vision is, it's what the vision does. So we have to start with a vision. And these things are really great motivators to move us to a certain point that we want to be. Third, is challenging and changing our assumptions and our mental models. When I came here to one of the previous pledge meetings, people talked about some of the new inventions part of it. And I was in awe. I didn't know that much about electricity, and we're talking about how to Move electricity, and that before, every, before Wi-Fi was created, everything was Wi-Fi. I, I learned so much. So, um, mental models. Well, I mentioned before, I'm Jewish. My wife is Irish Catholic. So the rabbi who agreed to marry us, he, he suggested, kind of he ordered, us to take an introduction to Judaism class. Which, when I heard this piece of cake, I'm going to ace the class. That poor Nancy's going to struggle. So guess who got the A, and guess who almost won it? But in the, during the class, he was talking about the Jewish wedding ceremony, which takes place where? Under a 
chup, no. See, if you say chup, it's not good enough. You have to say chup, enough so that you're spitting in my face so I can spit back. You know. It's a chup. And that's what you do. So as a rabbi, and the word rabbi in Hebrew means teacher. So he's a teacher who knows this stuff. He said, he was talking about the wedding ceremony. And this woman in the back of the room said, you know, rabbi, you're wrong. Only Jewish people can go into the chuppah. And the rabbi very kindly and nicely said, there's nothing in the laws and regulations that prohibit anyone from any faith or religion coming under the canopy. And he starts to go on, the woman from the back of the room goes, no, rabbi, you're wrong. And again, very kindly, he turns around and said, no, actually, anyone can go into the chuppah. He said, a third time, she yelled, no, rabbi, you're wrong. I was sitting near a window. And I expected a lightning bolt from whatever God was watching to come right through the window and destroy us. Now, why do you think she said that? Why do you think she said that? Well, once, because it's like overwhelming. <laughs> why do you think she said that? I'm not gonna, we're not gonna go any further past that. Someone gives me an answer. Because she was convinced of it. Huh? Because she was convinced of it. She was convinced, and how was she convinced of it? Because of her belief. And how did she get her belief? She learned it from. And who did she learn it from? Somebody who told her. Someone who told her. This could go on forever. Uh, but we, we don't know where she got the belief, and I don't know the answer to it. But God. God, that's right. Well, she thought so. I mean, she could have heard it from a priest. She could have heard it from a rabbi. She could have heard it from a friend, a well-intentioned mother, grandmother, parent, friend, teacher. We don't know. But she held firmly in the belief. And good leaders will challenge what we call mental models or assumptions. And that's what's going to help solve these problems of leadership in water. To really chat, you know, we can't do anything about drought in Somalia. Well, maybe we can. And to take that defeatist attitude and turn it into a positive for a good shared vision is very important. Fourth, team learning. Senge has a wonderful statement about learning in teams. He said, why is it that if we have a team that averages on, of, of, the, of the team, with an average IQ of 120, our ideas have an average IQ of 80. When I tell this to people, everyone goes, that's right. Why? Well, we dumb it down, we compromise. Why couldn't we argue that if the team has an average IQ of 120, that through synergy, you could have an average IQ of 180? So team learning is something we go into in our class, right? And the, you know, Partha, the, the project we do. So to see how the team can get above the average of the IQ of the room. And last but not least, these problems will never be solved unless we think more systemically, more holistically. And if you don't know about systems thinking now, first thing you have to do is, is either Google it, buy any of the send you books, go to the Society of Organizational Learning. This is a topic that will make you, first of all, if you have personal reasons of being a great leader, will make you a great leader. It's thinking about the whole, which none of us really, we're born as systems thinkers. I watch my kids, they're terrific systems thinkers. They bring in everything. Somewhere along the way, we lose it. So the things is, so those are the five disciplines that Sandy talks about. So here's what I want you to do. It's a quick exercise. I want you to first stand up. This will get them away quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, I want you to, you, you lied to me, because I know you all have a definition of at the very least, you know it when you see it. And you would know it if I interviewed each one of you individually and said, if you were to rate your leadership on a scale of one to 10, let's pretend there was a ladder with 10 rungs, and the top, top, ladder of that, uh, the top rung of that ladder was leadership nirvana. You really know all the ins and outs of leader. You are the world's greatest expert. Self-actualization on the Maslow scale. I want you to think real hard now, if you were to give yourself a number, where are you in terms of your own leadership? I want you to actually give yourself a number, one being the lowest, 10 being the highest. Does everyone have a number? Is it a linear scale or a What? Is it a linear scale or a <laughs> There's always somebody in the room. Yes, God, I know. I, I have two numbers, I'm 11 and minus 11. Minus it? That's yes, an interesting because, answer. Because uh, I think 11 is what I believe. Yeah. I believe I'm self-actualized. I believe I know it. I believe everything you've said probably is common sense and I know it. That's one. But do I exercise it? Do I implement it in the real world? No. In that, I'm minus right. 
that's a great topic because that, that's that's what I'm feeling when I hear about this topic. I worried last night, and this is the God's honest. I wasn't going to mention this. It's the God's honest truth. Yesterday, at some point during the day, in my bare feet, walking around my house, I must have bumped my toenail into something. And it ripped the toenail, but I didn't know it. I didn't feel it. Last night, I, I had difficulty sleeping because the little tear in the nail bothered me in my sleeping. I'm thinking, when I woke up this morning, knowing I was coming here, I felt so ashamed that my biggest concern in life was a broken toenail. And what am I doing about the world to help with water and leadership? Well, maybe this is a little bit. So now you all have a number from 1 to 10. Yes? Just curiously, look around the room. I want you to raise your hand. Who gave themselves a 1? Nobody. Good. 2. Smart group. 3. 4. There's no wrong answers. 5. 6. 7. 8. 9. 10. No. Um, all right, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to look around the room, so turn around and look around. Find someone you do not know. And walk up to them and say, I'm a five, and in order to get to be a six, I think I need to do this. All right? I want you to know what your deficit is, how you need to get to that next level of leadership. You're only going to take five minutes of this, so each person has to get two and a half minutes. Go. Find a stranger and talk about how do you get to the next level. You know each other. I think I have an idea. How's the connection? How about you? I heard Brazil alone. Probably the same thing. We really should have a good connection. It's all about a new idea. <laughs> Getting things done. Yeah. Can't get things done unless you try to get it. Our small idea, big idea. That's the challenge. Most of us face that challenge. It's the most difficult thing to do. Especially in a group of strangers. Right, right. You know, they're the new team, but you don't know the person. I worked with them for 15 years, so I know how to connect with them. Yeah. 
talking to some degree about some deficit or some goal to go further. How was that? Well, one or two, please. Yeah. yeah. Um, it made me realize that my deficit is um, kind of a reflection of my feelings. So, making it feel not so bad about it, but it made me realize that the field in general needs to be um, challenged and move further and Excellent, yeah. And, and, and our professions really do help make this abstract definition a little bit clearer because we know what a top surgeon would be, for example, vis-a-vis -vis someone just starting an internship. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, similarly that there's sort of regardless of how many years of experience you have, that there's always kind of a ceiling that you're trying to continue to break through. So you're constantly still searching for a new way to challenge yourself or take a new risk uh, to be a better leader. Yeah. And so, and so it's about risk taking. It's, ta it's taking that extra step. And I think those of you that were, you know, five, or six, seven, eight, you know, you probably have to take more of a risk. I want to conclude by just saying two things that I learned from great research at the Center for Creative Leadership. CCL was very concerned about why it was that certain leaders fell off the tracks, derailed. That as we hired Sam to be the leader of our organization within the next four or five years. And at the, at the end of year two, Sam totally disappeared. He fell off the track, he fell off the radar. And they called this derailment, not surprisingly enough. Why do leaders derail? So they did a wonderful bit of research, which resulted in at least our class at TGI taking a 360 called Benchmarks, or skill scope, which is based on that research. But the, I want to leave you with the two research findings which I think are fabulous and something that we should embrace. One is the skills that got us to where we are today, the skills that got us to where we are today are not necessarily the skills we need going forward. And the second is strengths over use can potentially be a weakness. Now both of those seem to make sense, don't they? Skills that got us to where we are today may not be the skills we need going forward. What does that mean? Does that mean I have to reject all that I've learned to get to this level? No, I'm going to stick to this. Well, this is called the comfort zone, right? I'm comfortable. You have to break through your comfort zone, even in thinking of matters of, of the drought of leadership or the drought of water. We've got to do more. We've got to learn new skills. We've got to challenge ourselves to get out of our comfort zone because that's where learning takes place. Strengths overused can possibly be a weakness. I know in my, in my I love humor. You maybe can tell a little bit. My wife sometimes gives me swift kicks under the, under the table. I have more black and blue marks on my knee because she said, this is the time to be serious. Your skill of humor is not going to work today. Be serious. I'll show you the black and blue marks later. It would be a great uh, thing to break. Anyway, <laughs> thank you for your attention. I want to turn it back over to Parther, who says, I have more important things to say than you do, Jerry. So I want to give it back to Parther. <laughs> <laughs>